uh, we have the great privilege to have on this very stage in this very city of Bucharest at the very Bucharest Forum, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, it might be better to lower expectations. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm that smart, so <laughs> if I see smarter people than myself, this is, uh, this is something which is relatively common. Um, Steve Clements um, is not only the editor-in-chief of uh, The Atlantic Life and editor-at-large uh, for The Atlantic, which is by all means the most uh, respected, influential, and uh, quality press in America today. And for the ones who are not reading or uh, getting uh, podcasts or TV uh, content from uh, uh, The Atlantic, uh, please do so. I do this every morning. I also do with a smaller sister organization which is called Quartz, which is more on business. Yes. And I also do something uh, that is also very close to the Aspen Institute, Romania, and the global Aspen network, which is City Lab. That's another site also under the Atlantic that they are trying to find smart solutions for uh, management of modern cities all around the world. So that's a great organization itself. The second thing before getting uh, to, to our guest of honor this afternoon, um, Aspen Institute of the United States, which is the flagship of our network, global network. That's where the whole story started after the Second World War. They've been conducting for a number of years the most exciting, intellectually challenging, and motivational international conference called the Ideas Festival. And Aspen US is organizing in Aspen, Colorado every summer the Ideas Festival in partnership with The Atlantic. So for us, as Aspen Romania, a smaller organization, we are only 10 or 11 years in this business, but we are thriving. And we try to move to the next level and trying to find local international partners that will be able to move high quality content. Steve, we had two days in Bucharest, exceptionally high quality content in English, in Chinese, in Mandarin, in uh, French, in Italian, whatever, wherever people came from, this was a high-end quality conversation. So what we try to, to basically uh, identify and for us to move forward, also with the other six Aspen Institutes in Europe, we are seven in Europe, Aspen Germany, Aspen Italy, Aspen France, Aspen mm. Spain, Aspen Central Europe in Prague, us and Aspen Kiev in Ukraine. It's seven of us. And we also want to make sure that we do these kind of things. The third thing, um, we know each other for some time. We've been together to many conferences. But last spring, I got an, I got an invitation from Aspen US to go to an ideas festival where? In Abu Dhabi. <laughs> OK, ideas festival in Abu Dhabi. For a Romanian <laughs> and from, uh, let's say, somebody from our region that we believe we are the centers of the universe, and sometimes we are, most of the times we don't, uh, I said, what the heck? And I start looking at the invitation. Walter Isaacson, uh, uh, David Bradley, the owner, still the owner of the Atlantic, uh, and other friends, say, Elliot Gerson from the Aspen mm -hmm. Institute, said, we do a great conference in Abu Dhabi, in the Emirates. Okay. But where did this, this, this take place? At the New York University compound in Abu Dhabi. Okay. And then who's going to attend? Tony Blair, uh, the Lady Minister for Tolerance from the Emirates, mm. Steve Clements. Um, and I was there also with my wife. And my wife is a relatively uh, um, uh, guarded person. She doesn't express much feelings in public. Mm. Um, and at the healthcare session, to give you an example, when they had a conversation like I've never attended before, not even in America, my wife is filming with a smartphone the whole mm -hmm. conversation, and then she was filming, you still have you on, on, uh, on camera, just to tell you that America or the West are not the only places when we have smart conversations. Abu Dhabi could be one place, Bucharest could be another place, 
Hong Kong or Shanghai or whatever could be another place, as long as you have the ingredients. And the ingredient in Bucharest today is Steve Clements. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're leaving stage, so, so it's great, no, no. To, great to be with you. Uh, what a, it went, it's, it's such an honor, thank you. And with Bucharest, uh, I want to just say that I was here one time in 1996 at 4 a.m. in the airport. It's a long story in how this happened, but I was with Al Haig and the chairman of United Tech. We were on our way to Asia, uh, and, and it turns out that a Romanian entrepreneur bought Michael Jackson's old 707 plan, the, 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 the world tour uh, uh, plane that Michael Jackson went on, and that plane was the one that we took to Asia through Bucharest. And uh, it, was ex it was an extraordinary uh, experience. And I said, you know, I've got to get back. And so uh, thank you so much for your invitation and coming here. I guess today I'm going to sit, I've flown all night and I haven't slept and I have lots of energy, but maybe, you know, sit and talk. I want to have a conversation with all of you about the, the broad question of, of um, you know, what, what's going to break and how, how I would think about that question. And it's a complex one because it's a little bit of a futurist. And you have to ask yourself, what are the big trends? No, I'm not going to sit. I'm going to walk. The, I think when you think about the trends that are going on right now, uh, and you don't know, there's a friend of mine, Charlie Kupchin, who wrote a very provocative book some years ago called The End of the American Era or The End of the American Century. And, and it was one of these things where he was like, this is well before we saw Donald Trump on the horizon. But he was looking at certain kinds of steps that were going on in the world, in which the US role in the world and the US willingness to invest in the kind of global superstructure it had invested in, and its share of the global economy, and the kind of break between the benefits that, that he felt Americans felt like they were getting from the international engagement that, that America was committing to was coming undone. That other nations were rising like China, uh, uh, other nations in Asia, you had Europe organizing in a certain way. So we've kind of just pretended as sort of a matter of faith in some ways that the United States was just going to continue to keep doing what it was doing all along without regard to returns or the sense of cost or trying to figure out what a new global social contract would be. And so Charlie Kupchin, who later worked for President Obama on his National Security Council staff, you know, he was at the Council on, Foreign, uh, 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 Council on Foreign Relations, was provocatively challenging the national security establishment in the United States, who hated this book. Everybody hated this book because it's a threat to their prominence. It's a threat to the way they think about America and the world. It's a threat to what they saw as, you know, if, if they happen to be guys, their manhood uh, or their womanhood as great national security players in the world. And, and, but it was probably true. And what he then said about the George W. Bush administration that came in, you know, and others, is that they were speeding up history. Well, Donald Trump has taken us to a far end. And Donald Trump is the first United States president to actually say what's been on the minds of a lot of Americans is that, and I have to tell you that I disagree with this, but my relatives, I have 100 cousins, second and third cousins in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Michigan. I may be the only, where's my friend from CNN? Is there somebody from CNN in here? He's going to be on the next panel. He's not in here yet. What's that? Not here yet. Well, very few people in the media in America have 97 cousins that supported Donald Trump out of 100. 90, I polled my cousins. 97 out of 100 voted for Donald Trump. So blame my family. It was such a close race. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was the, the Clemens clan. But, but the reason they support us, I come from a very military family, from a very basic, uh, not, not uh, well-educated anywhere throughout my, my, my uh, cousins. My family joined the military, went off to serve in the Army, the Air Force, the, the Navy, uh, in Vietnam, in Korea, uh, World War II, uh, Afghanistan, and Iraq. They would come back. And more recently, recent, the recent 10, 15 years, people come back and they couldn't get jobs. Or they were in a job working for Hewlett Packard in Dallas, Texas, lost their job three times, and they trained their Indian uh, successor. It was one of these classic stories. And so there was this, this, this you know, silly line that used to be out there that America fought the Cold War, but China won. But it did feel like a real thing to a lot of families in the Midwest that felt that they were getting less and less of the benefits. And it is interesting that when, when you, know, you look at the Marshall Plan, you look at the foundation of NATO, which is so important. I know when I came to the airport today, I saw there's a big NATO parliamentary assembly meeting coming, uh, going on in Bucharest right now, that, that the, the uh, uh, 
big institutions that we all created and that the United States helped lead on but had many partners on, that there, is, that there were benefits, let's just be honest. Trade deals used to benefit the United States more than the other countries. You know, the reserve currency status of the dollar that basically got established allows the U.S. economy to organize itself in ways that the Romanian economy cannot organize itself. We get benefits from it, but what began happening was your average American, particularly your lesser educated American, began to get impacted more dramatically. And we've been talking about this for 20 years. When I worked in the United States Senate in 1990, uh, 1995, 96, 97, I wrote a report called the Senate Democratic High Wage Jobs Report. And it was for the Democratic uh, folks in the Senate, just to be clear, because I used to be, I was the first executive director of the Nixon Center for Peace and Freedom, and that was on more of the Republican side. So I'm one of the few people who's played in both playgrounds, the Democrats and the Republicans. But at that time, you saw that this IT boom that America was experiencing, Bill Clinton was president of the United States, the kind of globalization that was spreading, you know, Bill Clinton-style globalization, whatever was good for a multinational was good for America, was a kind of high-trust globalization. Ideas, people, institutions, money, move more frictionlessly around the world. That was the globalization that everybody thought that Tom Friedman was writing about in his golden straitjacket, Lexus and the Olive Tree, and it's just, a false promise, because what we've seen is walls have gone up, that there's a, there's a high fear globalization that we have today. Walls have gone up, people feel the impact of being connected to India and China and what it'll do to their job in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, or what it'll do in St. Louis, Missouri. And so it's created inside the United States an incredible feeling of zero-sum tensions, of competition between different groups, between the, those that are perceived to be rich, and there's a lot of wealth in the United States, and those that are being left behind. There are tensions between the Hispanic and the black communities inside cities. We talk about the white communities, but it's, it's also between the Hispanics and blacks who are fighting, they feel over for the same space as they grow in. It's a very tense time in the United States. Probably, if you wanna be honest, in many ways, while you don't see the public manifestation in the same way as, as the, the uh, uh, Vietnam War, there is probably a more serious tension today than we even had in 1967, 68. And that is very worrisome. And what does that mean for international affairs about what will break? What it means is that, and we've already seen this in Donald Trump, and I just did a, a, a wonderful interview. It wasn't that I was good, it's just the questions I just got asked by Romanian TV were so damn good. They were fantastic in terms of asking me about where the US is in the world right now, and what should we be looking at? There are a lot of people that, that think that the America uh, engagement in the world with NATO alliances and whatnot will remain strong, will remain in place, and, that, and that's good. It may be a little bit of wishful thinking, but, it's, but it is what Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, thinks. It's what's Rex Tillerson, who's a sort of, uh, you know, slightly failing Secretary of State, but good guy, uh, but not doing too well. He thinks that. H.R. McMaster, the President's National Security Advisor, is a big believer in the relationships in NATO, the transatlantic uh, relationship, um, our commitments in Asia. President Trump is not like that. President Trump is willing to help out anybody who pays him to do it. America is gonna stand by allies who've paid up more uh, to do it. We're, we're putting um, the Pentagon out for profit right now. I mean, we're shaking down allies in trade deals. We're sending shockwaves into alliances. I have written and talked on TV in the United States a bit that there can be a good side of this in terms of knocking out the inertia of relationships that haven't been refigured in a long time. And when you fear that something might get lost, you can all of a sudden get back and negotiate about what's really important and get back to first principles of why fundamental relationships matter so much. Why does Romania matter to the US? Why does Eastern Europe matter to the United States? Because we fought a very, very long Cold War over uh, uh, self-determination, over uh, uh, Russian and Soviet expansion, uh, that directly threatened the United States in very key ways. This all was part of our, you know, not so long ago history. I certainly, I started out as a Soviet watcher, a Soviet arms control guy uh, at the Rand Corporation, my first job. And, and you know, there, I was just driven in by uh, Andra and Alexander. They don't remember uh, all of that. It just kind of continues to shock me. We have a whole new generation of people that have no memory of those times, and I think it's very important because those are the stakes that are being that are being discussed. So when you look at what's going to break, and I want to open this up for discussion with all of you, is I think if you go back, there are two things that could break. One, the United States itself could kind of break, in a sense that we get so consumed with our internal divisions that are nasty 
and raw. And, and we have a president right now who seems to be okay with that in terms of making them nastier and rawer uh, on occasion. And that then limits your willingness to invest anything in the rest of the world. The other part of that is, I think, in, in the international dimension, since we are in a kind of high, high fear globalization, in other words, we all are connected, and yet there are real problems with that. And they range the cross from whether it's transnational narco crime to dealing with climate change and its impacts, which uh, the United States is walking away from. And we're sort of in this phase right now, which is awkward. Um, I, was, I was asked at, you know, by, by NBC to comment on what Donald Trump should do at the UN General Assembly in his speech. So I hadn't read his speech, I hadn't seen his speech. And I said, look, he's not gonna do it, but the thing he should do is communicate to other countries. We are as concerned about their existential threats as we hope they are concerned about our existential threats. Mutual concern and a global social contract is what he has to you know, say. Did he do that? No, he didn't do that. He raised a lot, he continued to say, I want all of you to see North Korea and China and Asia the way we see it and to organize around our needs on this, but I'm not gonna do anything with you on climate. Uh, we're gonna allow these divisions in the Middle East to stand. And so what you see is a contraction. And I've been interested, I follow the Chinese kind of intelligence world as closely as I can. If we have friends from China, don't tell anyone. But, but um, you know, just to sort of, get, I'm interested in how they see us. Usually it's interesting to go to another country to get an offshore perspective that's not corrupted by our friendship. And the Chinese are very lucid. They really don't want to see America fall apart. But they look at us as in strategic contraction right now. And they look at what the problems are for them in that, and they look at what the opportunities are in that. And I find that exactly to be the case is the way I see it, is America, whether we like to admit it or not, is in a kind of strategic contraction. And that means if you ask what's first gonna break, you go back to all the classic fault lines where America's role mattered. When Richard Armitage, the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State, went in and literally stopped what was likely to be a real nuclear exchange between Pakistan and India, which everybody thinks is getting on, they're never really getting along well, by the way. Uh, uh, you go back to these classic things. Right now, North Korea, South Korea, maybe I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it because we have two erratic leaders that are basically impugning each other at a personal level and that can go in ways that none of us can predict. But there's so much superstructure around that, there's still, a relative lower chance of that. But the, the fault line everybody worries about, and what has always classified is at the first place you could really see a, a breakout breakdown is something like India-Pakistan, because they, they have an inability to restrain themselves. The United States has been a cork in that bottle. There are probably a lot of other places like that. In Latin America, uh, Venezuela is going in awful uh, bad directions. But you know, those big systemic questions, that takes us back to Russia. And what is Russia? doing. Uh, you know, maybe Vladimir Putin, some of you know, probably know him. Uh, I've, I've met Putin once. I don't know him. I wouldn't pretend to know him. I sort of sense that he sees himself as the Ronald Reagan of Russia, as the morning in, it's morning in Moscow. You know, we're bolder, we're bigger, we're muscular, we're showing, we're back. And that's what Ronald Reagan did for the United States. And so half of what he does is show, and half of it is strategic. Because Russia is failing on so many different levels, but for right now, it's playing an aggressive game. It's playing its cards in a way that, that threaten us. And I worry about that sense of strategic contraction, some of the misfires in the, in, I won't say the Trump-Putin relationship, but the, 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 the raising of expectations and the dashing of expectations in the US-Russia relationship over a very short period of time and what we've just seen in Ukraine, Moldova, I, I think, and then the kind of, I would say, sophistication that Russia is developing in hybrid war, which you see as deployed against the United States in the hacking case, right? So you see what happened in Ukraine, you see what's happening in places, I would argue, in Moldova and others, where it's not, you know, the United States is thinking, you know, if you watch our TV, we're talking classic war. You know, countries go to war. Russia's not doing that. Russia goes in, little green men here and there, not unflagged, cyber war, cyber terror. This whole cyber area is an area. And so when you ask, that's another area that I think will break. We had, um, when we were in Aspen together, uh, Aspen Ideas this summer, so that was what, end of June, first week of July, I had dinner, and I can say it now publicly, with the CEO of a very big power company in the United States called Southern Company. Uh, and Southern Company has a lot of nuclear power plants. They have one of the major uh, power producers in the southern part of the United States. And he is an, he's, a, he's considered to be one of the people who can talk to Trump directly. They exist in the league. There were two nuclear power plant companies 
that that week we were there were penetrated by state-based actors and had malware that had reached through the highest level of defenses. Nothing happened. It was done. It was reported. It was classified as to which companies these were, and it was classified right up until the point there. But then they began, it, once it hit the press, it got out there. So when you ask what can break, that kind of thing that's going on right now of state-based actors, and they're building more and more and more, not just hacking into Sony and you know, putting out uh, 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 nefarious emails about what actors and actresses said about management or vice versa, but very serious infrastructure penetration, which the United States has done, uh, uh, with, with Israel's partnership, as we saw, in, you know, and I would, I do know we did this with, with uh, Iran and, and the Stuxnet virus, but that lesson gave lots of other countries the, the, the teaching moment to figure out how to do it elsewhere. So that's another area that I don't think gets studied of what could break. That could seriously break, and what you see is a lot of countries willing to, it's the one area where countries that invest in this area can basically, on a state-based level, go do nefarious things in, in the United States, in China, in elsewhere, under false flags to create tensions. And so we may see the kind of certainty, you know, China and the United States, for instance, have invested a huge amount, as, as, as NATO has invested a huge amount with rivals and countries in making sure that if you're going to go to war and have a conflict, let's at least know why we're doing it and that we're doing it. Let's not let miscalculation, miscommunication, you know, get in the way of that. And right now, today, Donald Trump, I mean, I, 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 there are certain things about Donald Trump I, I will say I appreciate and think, but Donald Trump right now believes that it is in the national security of the United States to look like he's sort of crazy, to make sure he's sort of unpredictable, to let, make miscalculation and the blurriness of things uh, be there. And that also creates a risk, particularly around North Korea. So why don't I stop there for a moment? Those are the things that I think are the big issues that we have to chew on. Uh, want to provoke us and you know, hear from you guys. And I'm willing to talk about anything if you guys want. I'll tell you even Donald Trump's good sides if you like. So uh, uh, thoughts, questions, reactions? Do we have a mic going around? Is that how we're doing this? You do. Hi. What's your name? Florentina. Florentina? Yes, Florentina. Okay, good. Well, Florentina, I hope you're going to run. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, I my had... gosh. Was that all being translated? I am so sorry. I realize I spoke so fast. <laughs> Please forgive me. No, uh, yeah. Right. Um, thank you for your very inspiring presentation. If I may, um, I have one question and a half. Yeah. Uh, the first question was uh, would be linked to the uh, complexity, increasing complexity and novelty of the uh, global environment. Not mm -hmm. talking the natural, natural. Right. right? All right, so we have a system of global institutions that goes back quite a long time. Right. What shall be done, or what do you think should be done? About institutional change? About those institutional changes. Well, that's, that's one question yeah. one. And the half question mm -hmm. is about the break um, issue. What, what's going to break? You mentioned uh, uh, an extremely exciting list, and I, if I got it you correctly, uh, you give high probability, higher probability, higher probability. to uh, India-Pakistan conflict than to the nuclear uh, non North Korean file. Right. right. Um, I think that President Trump is going, if he has not done already, to give up the Iran pact. Yes. Uh, isn't that an even more serious uh, possibility of a break. Well, the question of what you mean is break. So let me start with that uh, on the issue of break. It, if, if you mean Iran and the United States in a kinetic war, kinetic action right away, no. Because the Iranians, I'm sorry? Oh, in the area? Yes, it's another area I should have added. I mean, I think right now we're sending um, bizarre signals to Saudi Arabia. Bizarre signals. Um, and I don't quite get it because the Saudis, I do understand, and this, this is what I worry about global fragility and which makes this futurist projection so complicated. The fact is because of the fact that most of the world that is allied with the United States isn't sure about the solvency of their relationship with us, the solvency of their alliance, they're making different bet bets. We look, talk about Iran, North Korea, bad players in the world, what about the good players who just are changing the way they behave? 
What about allies of the United States like a Japan or an Israel or a Saudi Arabia that are just behaving differently? There's just no doubt that Saudi Arabia has taken a far more activist uh, hand in the region in a way that it wasn't doing before when the United States was clearly perceived to be more of the deliverer of security and stability and deals uh, in, in the region. And that goes for Yemen, that goes for, I would say, Bahrain, the, the neighborhood, the split with Qatar, and, and what's going on with Iran. And I think, yeah, there, there, there's a potential, potential there. I still think it's lower than India, Pakistan, but you know, I wouldn't quibble with that. I, I do think I completely agree with you on that issue. Um, and we, I don't know, but I, 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 it's a very interesting piece. I just got uh, Javad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. He may have an article in The Atlantic coming out in a, in a day or two. So, so I will look, look for it. And, and, and there may be some interesting responses uh, if we could do it. So I'll leave it at that. But I think it could be an interesting uh, exchange that we host that sort of looks at this broad set of questions. Uh, and I'm trying to get people like Senator Tom Cotton and others to potentially participate in a, in a very uh, robust discussion about this. I'll mention one other thing about Iran. When John Kerry, I don't want to put words in his mouth because they were off uh, the record, but um, I used to meet John Kerry quite frequently. And, and in the evolution of the Iran deal, after the Iran deal, what was very clear to me with not just Secretary Kerry and others, but that in problem solving bit by bit, not dealing with all the issues about Iranian support for terrorism in the region, and I don't want to walk away from that, is that in problem solving on very specific deals, Iran was becoming a more comfortable partner for the US. Saudi Arabia was becoming a more complicated ally that, that, with the US. And that was where things are going. With Donald Trump, it's kind of gone back the other way again. And again, it's like Russia, where you had expectations moving in a certain direction and not. I saw Javad Zarif, the, the Iranian foreign minister, a week ago Monday uh, in New York. And, and uh, I just think it's very clear that regardless of how this non-certification, what Donald Trump is going to do so that people understand, he's going to say that the Iran deal is not in the United States national security interest. That's what he's reported to, to say. That isn't decertifying the deal. This then throws this to the United States Congress to take action or not take action on that. And there are leaders that want to reimpose sanctions on Iran, which would put the United States out of compliance with the deal. Four days ago, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, guess who his boss is? Donald Trump is his boss. Jim Mattis said that the Iran deal is in the national security interest of the United States. So you have, how if you are, a, if, if you're Iran, if you're Saudi Arabia, if you're Japan, if you're South Korea, how do you look at what US policy is? You don't know. Uh, if we go by just what the president is saying, then, then it is not, but it's a negotiation, it's a, it's a wrestling match in public, and we've never seen anything like this. So it's something to, to consider. On the institutional reform side of the, the, um, the world, you know, I have long thought the United States dragged its feet, that it could have gotten ahead of a lot of these changes if it had been more of a proponent of institutional reform at the UN, of, of certain of the international organizations. I, I won't, I don't know about NATO as much. NATO seems to have an internal flexibility, which is a bit better. But on the broader side of the UN, um, we need a new global deal. We need a new global social contract. And the only way to do that is to bring other of the big rising stakeholders in, in a more serious and permanent way, and to uh, revise the voting. We have a very old power structure for very old issues that's not matched with the world today. And I think we've got to change that. I think we could have changed it. I think Barack Obama, made a mistake. I think President Obama, when he came in, you had to realize that when he came in, the perception of American power was so low. Nobody thought the US could do anything. The, the, no one thought the US economy was going to do well because we were in the economic crisis. And Iraq punctured the mystique of American power in the world by demonstrating a limit, our limits. Used to be, you could go to England, you could go to India, you could go to Malaysia, you could go to France. Didn't matter, developing or developing, we'd go to China. No one saw America having boundaries or limits until the Iraq War. The Iraq War collapsed uh, American prestige and the sense that we would be able to deliver it. And that, that was a big, big problem. And I said to, the, to, I wrote to President Obama at the time, I said, look, there are a few areas where you could be the Nixon goes to China guy. You could, you could change the way the world looks at the United States. That means Iran. The only opportunity was an Iran deal, which I think President Obama left too late. 
in his term. You had Cuba. You could end the Cold War with Cuba quickly and do something in Latin America. He left that too late in a way that was no longer strategically significant. He did Israel-Palestine first, which he failed in, and he probably should have done that last, in my view, because you needed to build up the sense that America could bend the international system in good ways and move things forward. But the most important thing I thought Obama would do or could do was to open up the pan, you know, that box on the issue of how do you revise the international arrangements of the United Nations particularly, but other international institutions, to bring the developing world and new larger uh, stakeholders in and build a new global social contract about what we basically care about in the world and let other nations have a greater say in that. Had we done that, I think a lot of the problems that we have in the world today would be in a different place. And, and I just regret that, that, that the United States didn't lead in doing that. I think we were foot dragging uh, on it. So. Sorry, how about other comments, questions? Sorry to be, so yes sir, hi. So my question is more about the internal dynamics of US politics. So what you've said seems, I mean, it's, it's great and very coherent and it's wonderful to listen to that kind of uh, good perspective on American foreign policy. But I think it's probably something that uh, most of the US Congress is probably uh, privy to, right? So it's not like you've been, you or other public intellectuals have been keeping these opinions or analyses secret. No. And they seem to have an awareness about these things, uh, at least with regards to Russia, in that they've taken the unprecedented step of sidelining the president when it comes to sanctions to Russia, just to avoid the possibility that he might not sign them. Why do you think things are different when it comes to Americans positioning in things like the Iran deal, North Korea, signals being sent to allies. Why do you think there, there's a much more of a reticence when it comes to taking direct action there than in Russia, considering that one would be as unprecedented as the other? So, great questions. Uh, I think the North Korea deal is not out. So, let, let me just be, I may be very wrong here. This, the president could do something so erratic, or Kim Jong-un could do something so erratic and, and uh, dangerous and needing such a serious response. Right now you have an escalation in these flamboyantly reckless uh, responses to each other. Um, you've had moments where Kim Jong-un dialed it down, uh, and you've had moments, I mean, particularly when, when uh, President Trump had his first meeting with uh, Prime Minister Abe at Mar-a-Lago, his, his retreat down in Florida, and they had that open air situation room, you know, where Donald Trump was inviting pals into the, you know, here, come meet Abe, we're talking about North, you know, what to do. But he was remarkably, I mean, I, I remember going on TV and say this is the first time we've seen Donald Trump demonstrate restraint in what he said, how he commented, and it was something to take note of because it's important and I, and I gave Trump praise uh, for that because it could have been a wildly overdone uh, action. You may remember, uh, in, I think it was April of 2001, you had the Chinese uh, EP3 incident with the United States. And uh, George W. Bush was being pushed by Paul Wolfowitz and a lot of neoconservatives in his government to really amp up the, the uh, uh, tempo and the temperature uh, in dealing with getting that plane back and kind of dealing with that issue. The Chinese were upset, but they weren't going to do it. But they were not. They were. They were not Kim Jong Un in that case. It was just so. So it was that very interesting case where President Bush's father sent people like James Baker and Brent Scowcroft. These names may not mean anything to you, but they were the old Republican national security establishment to counsel the younger President Bush to just calm it down, take this out of the headlines. We would, Donald Trump chases headlines. There's no risk. So it was an interesting moment in that. But I think. I may, I may not believe strongly what I'm about to say. I don't believe the US Congress today believes that Donald Trump is seriously close to a real military action in North Korea, even though he's trying to act like he is. I think they have, because if they were, then I think they would seek to make sure that they were consulted, because it would be, if, if, particularly if he's thinking of a preemptive strike or some first action, to not go to Congress, at least in any way, and look for any form of authorization, which most presidents would do with any initial strike. It's different if you're defending yourself uh, in something like this. But that's been missing and absent. And that's a sign to me that the Bob Corkers of the world, Senator Corker, who's chairman of the Senate for don't quite take seriously. I'm very, I, I know Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, who's the ranking member on the Intelligence Committee and others, so the, the, whether it's the Armed Services Committee or others in the Senate, they don't, 
the, you, you may recall that, I mean, you may not recall, I don't know, but the 100 US senators were bussed over to the White House to get this classified briefing on North Korea. And most of them thought it was sort of a joke later. And they thought the presentations were really poor. And they saw the Department of Defense as very confident in having really interesting plans. They saw Dan Coats, who was a former senator who's now head of Director of National Intelligence, as sort of weak and disorganized. Uh, and they were given these things. So I don't think they believe that Donald Trump right now is, is, is credible in terms of a near-term thing on there. So that's there. On the, but you asked about North Korea and... Right. So there's certain areas where it works. I mean, the, the other thing that the, that the Congress did, which I found really interesting, is, is that Robert Mueller, who is leading the investigation into potential collusion, well, various crimes, but particularly collusion uh, of Russia with any member of the Trump campaign uh, with regards to election, election meddling and hacking. I found it really quite astonishing that a Republican-controlled United States Senate, which would have had to go out of recess during our, our recent you know, fall period, that they would not allow themselves to go out of recess because they believe that Donald Trump would then really fire Jeff Sessions and that would create the cascading troop down to get rid of Mueller. And so they are so afraid, Republicans are afraid Trump was going to do that, that they didn't go out of session. This is the same party. So I think it is happening bit by bit by bit. But the, but the truth is that the, that the chief executive of the United States has enormous powers, enormous latitude, moving in a lot of ways. You've got really good national security advisors and uh, uh, personnel around him that they look as way. So, so I think they weigh in when they think it's desperate. And, and he could really be in excess, and I think otherwise they'll let him be the president because he was elected by the, by the people of the United States to be in who, who and what he is uh, and, and to go that direction. And you also wonder, um, I mean, honestly, I keep hoping Donald Trump will do better. Um, my, it was the G20, any of you at the G20 Hamburg meeting? It was kind of weird. Now we went to the G20. G20 Hamburger meeting was the big. It was a big deal because he was going to meet Vladimir Putin. You know, it should have been talking about climate change and NATO and all the kind of national security issues. But it really became the Putin, you know, the Putin-Trump uh, uh, dance, the waltz, and and we were getting signals from his national security advisor and others around him, Rex Tillerson, that he was not going to, that he was not preparing, that there was no preparation, that he was just going to lead it himself. Uh, and just, as I said, kind of wing it uh, and, and, and just improvise along the way. And I kept saying, maybe we're being fooled. Maybe we in the media are being led down this path that deep down he's getting really serious briefings. And there's going to be a 10-point plan about what the United States wants out of this meeting with Putin. And he's going to walk out of this with achievements I said, I really doubt that because I see no evidence of it whatsoever, but maybe there's an element of brilliance there and organization and synergy inside the US government where it's actually functioning and working, and absolutely not. He came out and, and, and Putin scored on everything Putin wanted to score on, and it's not clear that the United States got anything. So it's one of these things where um, it's very hard for Congress what not to balance or legislate around that but trying to kind of continue to encourage him to do the right things. And guess what? People like Senator Corker are saying that he doesn't have the temperament. He has not yet evolved into having the temperament of a true president of the United States. And that is from when the leaders of his own party is going to be retiring soon. But you know, this is the weird time. It's a very weird time. So yes, everybody knows. Everybody's aware. Uh, and and you know, what I find interesting is that President Trump, and I've talked with Jared Kushner. I've talked with H.R. McMaster. I've talked with Rex Tillerson. I've talked with Dina Powell, who's his, his deputy national security advisor, and they, they all generally believe that he has an opportunity. They, they are believers in him, and believers, in, and they believe that we, the Atlantic and, and other media, kind of manhandle and mistreat him a bit too much. So they look at some of us as more fair than others. But the bottom line is he does have a cadre of people who generally believe mostly in what he's doing, but everybody's concern level is up right now, and I think that's, that's tense, and he thinks that's helpful. I mean, this is the thing. Donald Trump thinks he's doing great. That's a problem, you know, so it is what it is. Sorry to go on so long about that, but it is interesting to talk about Trump, right? Would you come to a forum like this with an American who didn't talk about Trump? You know, yeah, you, would, you, want, yeah, you want Trump. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm Florin, uh, Florinita. I'm currently with your foreign service in Brussels. Okay. Still great to have you here and in Bucharest. And actually, I uh, would be grateful if you could share, I mean, use the chance that you're here and to, to shed a bit of light on 
uh, how articulated is this America First new approach? We, we got used to America First approach right. encapsulated in a so-called grand strategy. It have a political dimension, security dimension, uh, economic one uh, at home and globally. And now uh, we have America First and uh, combine what you say, this strategic retreat. We had a few years ago this uh, buzzword of leading from behind. So in a way, paving the way for this America first new approach. So really, uh, we're, I think we've been struggling to understand this in, uh, in Brussels. Well, and you can just say, you, I, I'm gonna comment, but we can also overthink these things, right? Sure. The leading from behind notion uh, which, which came from some high-level member of the Obama administration critiquing the president. I'm not going to say it was Henry Slaughter or anyone. You know, it could be someone that was critiquing the president, saying we're not out there forcefully on various human rights issues and challenges, et cetera. But what you know, President Obama's response is, you know, we need to work with our allies. We need to work in concert. We need to make sure we. Have, I mean, he had a five-point plan before he would take certain action, which I actually thought was pretty legitimate. So the question is, if you're trying to move the United States into something where there is a greater uh, sense of transnational common purpose to solve global public goods challenges and crises, then th I think that is what you know, got label leading from behind as somehow antithetical to what America was supposed to be about, is this cowboy running off alone. Guess what, cowboys running off alone are not particularly powerful and they're largely extinct. So you know, it's, 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 it's one of these things where you kind of look at it. So that, I tell people who you know, think, well, America leads from behind, I would talk to Dubuque, Iowa, to the World For Affairs Council or Colorado Springs, are we leading from behind? And I would explain why that's probably gonna get more results and you know, a stronger set of, of traction uh, with whatever problem you're gonna do if you're allied and working across with partners, which is what I think Obama was trying to do, maybe, maybe not. With, so with the America First side, if, for those of you who go back, David Sanger of the New York Times and Maggie Haberman, who are, uh, Maggie Haberman is the must read writer of the New York Times with her friend Glenn Thrush. Uh, there are a couple of people who just stand out beautifully in co covering this uh, president, but, but it was the David Sanger, Maggie Haberman interview with Donald Trump where they were going through, and it was, an, it was one of these interviews where the language that Donald Trump used, his syntax, his lack of ever completing a sentence was obvious. And the New York Times printed every element of it. It was a huge, sprawling uh, piece. And it was David Sanger, a New York Times reporter, said all of these things you're saying, it sounds like America first. He goes, yeah, it's America first. That's what, they, a New York Times reporter is responsible for the term and applying to, and then he, and he sucked up. He didn't walk in with this, this before, and then it became the kind of celebrated side. So I, 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 it, at, at his core, I think Donald Trump is dismissive and, and distrustful of the international system. But I think that the problem with overanalyzing America first is almost everyone, wrap it up, about every uh, person around Trump who cares about this has tried to describe America first as a coherent policy that nonetheless works with allies, works with NATO, works with our alliance with Japan, with Australia, with partners around the world. And so there's a bit of, a, of an effort to try to tell everyone nothing's really changed in America first, that, but that, that it's America leading and being in front, but nonetheless. But I don't think Donald Trump himself could articulate that, that kind of uh, uh, contraption that H.R. McMaster wants to do. Let's just be honest. He, want, he is a neo-mercantilist. You know, I've often written about, with all you know, due respect to my Chinese friends, you know, China is a, is a, is, has been, uh, in many ways, what Japan was, a kind of mercantilist uh, country through a certain phase of its economic development. And what Donald Trump is taking us back to is a kind of neo-mercantilist state of looking at trade deals, economic deals, alliances, shaking down alliances, uh, shaking down partners to do more than they would others do, and to kind of return what he sees as the net economic benefit, perhaps more, through a kind of forceful industrial policy, if you will, something that no Republican would ever have put their name on it before. That is, America first is industrial policy. America first is, you know, a greater, you know, some sort of walls up and sort of skepticism of the international system. And, and it means that, you know, when you come from a security side, I think the question is, let's just posit all this happens. Let's just say, America ends up disconnecting itself in some significant degree from uh, uh, a lot of the international engagements and, and obligations it has today. Not completely, but a significant chunk. 
then we're just a big country with a lot of sprawling apparatus, and you can sell it, you can you do transactions, you can, but it doesn't mean it's gonna be coherent, it doesn't mean you're gonna see the same kind of US-led order you saw in the world, and you're gonna see the United States move into something where I see the, the Department of Defense has been talking about a long time, is more of an offshore balancer in the world. Here it can matter, this way, this way, and in more of an ad hoc way as opposed to you know, the sort of global uh, uh, guarantor that it is today. And, and I think that Donald Trump is perfectly fine with that. I think many of the people around him are not. And, and again, I can't resolve those inconsistencies because they exist within the White House. People look, and I'll finish with this, those of you who are America watchers or watching the Politburo of you know, our country today like we used to watch in the Soviet Union, you know, the, the rivalries today are not Democrats versus Republicans. It's people and personalities inside the White House. That is where all of this is being fought uh, out right now in, in ways that even those who have been at this for decades have not seen this happen before. And so when we parse words like America first, there's a very, you know, it's very inconsistent across his administration. Then when you get to Congress and other players and leaders, they can't even, they can't even make a, uh, a, a coherent, uh, an attractive sell on it because it seems so uncomfortable because America has been trying to lead it. I, and, and you know where I saw this, this is, this is Europe, not Asia, but walking away from the TPP deal, I can't tell you how damaging that is to the United States and the region. Regardless of what labor interests, environmental interests, that, which may be legitimate, worries about uh, uh, meds and whatnot, what mattered was, you know, Prime Minister Lee of Singapore said, this was your party. Uh, there were winners and losers politically inside countries that were angling, that you were angling to kind of become part of this, that you were doing battle with. Some people's fortunes rose. So, so those that believed in the United States are now screwed uh, in that TPP deal. And then maybe they go on and do something like this, but it's one of the things that <clears throat> when you step back from these arrangements, how, what do you think is gonna happen? Do you think it's gonna be easy to trust US leadership again? So, so it's not, and so to a certain degree, America first, if that's what you're gonna call it, or this retreat, is going to happen anyway in a sense because America's gonna be slightly less um, trusted, not fully less trusted, but slightly less trusted, less able to kind of do as much deal making as it did before. And it means when it brings power and purpose to some of the things it's gonna to wanna to do while it has walked away from the purpose and objectives other countries have, it's gonna be harder. Everything is gonna be harder. And so I, that's my, my sad message today, is that all of the things that we kind of began to take for granted as a global commons and a kind of global working together is just gonna be less, less easy, uh, more complex, thus you're gonna have more conflict and you're gonna have more ad hoc responses, you're gonna have miscommunication and misdirection, and, that, and, and that's gonna suck for a while. So on that optimistic note, thank you so much.